This is a community event sponsored by the Lansing Area Peace Education Center. And I'd also like to take a moment to especially um, thank the public library for hosting this event. Uh, with MSU being out of session, uh, we really, really appreciate the hospitality. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to just introduce our panelists. We'll be hearing from three really brave doctors who traveled to Gaza in the last six months. Uh, they'll be sharing their experiences and letting us know what we need to know and hopefully what we can do to help alleviate the suffering due to this ongoing genocide, this forced famine, and the total leveling of Gaza, including uh, the Church of St. Porphyrus from the fifth century and the Omari Mosque from the seventh century. And I'm saying this because my uh, senior uh, thesis student, Hedy Omar, did his uh, final thesis for the religious studies department on the, on the destruction of religious sites in Gaza. So, and he got honors on that. So I'm just citing him and very proud of him. <laughs> Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Omar Kawash, who is going to be joining us on Zoom once this uh, properly heats up. He is a neurosurgeon at Sparrow who trained at MSU and has been practicing in the Lansing area for 22 years and went to Gaza with our second speaker, uh, Dr. Hisham Kandil. Uh, who is the Director of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Sparrow and Assistant Professor at MSU. And he did a large part of his training at Mayo Clinic. And uh, fun fact, he became a citizen, rushed to Detroit for an expedited passport, and then went to Gaza. So. And then uh, finally, we have Dr. Bara Zuhaili, and he is a general and vascular surgery specialist in Flint and a graduate of Damascus University Faculty of Medicine. And he has traveled to Turkey, Syria, Palestine, and Uganda to provide medical aid. So I just want to uh, have a warm welcome to these three incredibly brave doctors. And thank you for sharing your time with us and your experience and your knowledge. And I will turn it over. <laughs> Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. And thank you so much uh, for uh, coming here uh, this evening for uh, such an important uh, community event. Um, again, my name is Hisham Pandir. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, here in the uh, Lansing area. Uh, I uh, went to uh, Gaza in a, uh, a medical mission in mid March to uh, early April. And that was the first time for me to uh, visit Gaza or any part of Palestine, although I am of Palestinian descent. Both my parents were born in uh, Palestine, but uh, in 1948, uh, uh, when the occupation took place by Israel uh, and massacres uh, were uh, performed, uh, they had to uh, 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 flee from their homeland and they became refugees in Jordan and they were never, they were never given the right to uh, uh, go back to their homes. So it was a dream for me as a descendant uh, of uh, such a uh, family to uh, visit Palestine. So when I went to uh, Gaza at this time, I had uh, overwhelming emotions. I had uh, uh, tears of joy that I finally fulfilled my dream of uh, seeing uh, the homeland of uh, my parents. But at the same time, I had the tears of uh, sorrow that the first time to visit Palestine is being in such a catastrophic situation uh, when a huge, uh, when the genocide is taking place, basically, and uh, people were uh, starving. So uh, I know by now everyone knows uh, how the uh, conditions are miserable there, and uh, uh, the news is full of uh, these stories, but it's always different when you uh, uh, witness that uh, and see it by your own eyes. Uh, so I hope, I hope that our uh, experiences may uh, make things a little bit uh, closer uh, to you to uh, realize that how uh, uh, unfortunately uh, miserable and catastrophic the situation is. Basically, people there lack everything. So there's lack, in progress. there's lack of safety. So no one is safe there. So uh, obviously all the civilians not safe, including elderly, women, children, and even medical providers not safe. Journalists were not safe. Um, and even 
those who are providing aids and like from international agencies, and you are aware of how many people died actually in such uh, missions, they were not safe. So that's a place that lacks safety. Safety is not prison. There's 24 seven bombardments. There's 24 seven drones. If like, if there's no ongoing uh, uh, rockets or uh, bombardment, there are, uh, everyone hears the noises of the drones that they are anticipating a strike might happen at any time. So unfortunately, this became as a, a reality that the people got uh, used to, unfortunately, that a strike can uh, can take place at any moment. So that's a lack of safety. The other thing is the lack of uh, adequate food and, uh, and water. Uh, yes, there were some times when some aides uh, were allowed to enter, but it was a hit and miss, and not everyone was uh, having uh, uh, the access, appropriate access of such a thing. Um, and uh, there were times that uh, people were starving uh, 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 to death. Sorry, I'm cold, but this is, uh, doesn't seem from the hospital. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, there was... Uh, it has never happened before that an entire population experience and face food insecurity. So, and that is a really uh, a precedent. It has never happened before. 100% of the population, more than 2.2 million, having food insecurity. Yes, some people were having some access, but it was not guaranteed. Okay. Is it good? It, it seems like that. That's why I can. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. So, as I said, there was lack of safety, there was lack of uh, food and water, uh, there was lack of shelter. So, when I went there to Gaza, there were two hospitals that I was serving at. So, I was serving at the uh, Gaza European Hospital, which is uh, in uh, Khan Yunus, a little bit north to uh, Rafah. And I think everyone is familiar with Rafah, which is the uh, the southern part of uh, Gaza. Uh, so it's called the Gaza European Hospital and also served in another hospital called Shuhada Al-Aqsa, which is uh, in uh, Deir al-Balah, which is a little bit uh, in the middle part uh, of Gaza. When I say people there lack shelter, unfortunately, these two hospitals were serving primarily as shelters for people because many people who lost their homes and they don't have actually even tents to stay in. They were living in the hallways of the hospital, including the patients' rooms and sometimes in the, in the OR suites, because this is the place that they can have shelter at. So beside lack of safety, lack of food and drink, lack of uh, shelter, there's lack of having any human rights. So they, and this is did not unfortunately start after October 7th. You can realize that has you can combine the uh, the impacts for many decades, more than even before 1948 until now, and you can imagine how much they were lacking everything, all the their human rights were violated. And on top of that, now an active and massive genocide taking place and putting them at danger of uh, all these aspects. So now for us to, to go there was, uh, uh, a responsibility that we we felt that we have to go. We we did pursue any available channel to uh, to contribute, which is obviously nothing to to uh, fix. But at least uh, if every individual felt uh, with the little that I have, whether it's with my experience or with your financials or whether uh, with the public speaking or political impact, anyone who can have anything at least contribute. So as a medical provider, I felt that. Uh, I have to uh, go there and, and participate uh, with the, uh, a medical mission that allow me to uh, help uh, save some uh, patients there. So when we went there, as I said, hospitals, the, the two major hospitals there in Gaza were completely demolished. So uh, Al a Shifa hospital uh, was demolished and another hospital called An Nasser. So these two hospitals I told you about, there are smaller hospitals. The, some of them were not even designed to take any trauma. They were like OBGYN, like for, for women's health. These were designed now to be primary sites for uh, for uh, receiving casualties and, and uh, victims of, uh, of bombs. And you can imagine how unprepared these institutions are. And when we went there, there's lack of supplies in the hospital. There's lack of personnel. There's lack of medications. Like there's lack of ventilators, lack of even endotracheal tubes. And it is very sad that 
you are feeling that you're incapable of providing the care that you wish you can provide due to such lack of, uh, of supplies. Uh, one example, at uh, one time, uh, the ambulance brought four young kids. They were like ages ranging from two to four. Uh, they were all, unfortunately, burned. So the, just to see them, you can't control but crying. The first one we realized is already dead. So we immediately said, okay, let's spare our efforts to, to, to try to save the three other kids. But you see how overwhelming that is, like you are already put one kid aside that you can't uh, offer anything. The three other kids, we were trying to find in the trigger tube with a smaller size and we could not. Oh. So we were like struggling and multiple attempts until we finally able to put some tubes in and they were having some agonal breathing. And the next challenge, we did not even have ventilators at the, because all the ventilators were occupied. So we kept using the ambu bag there to try to save these young kids. And you know, unfortunately, the future doesn't look promising for, the near future doesn't look promising for these kids and they are unlikely to survive given lacking of everything that I was, I was telling you about. So that was a simple example of how Overwhelming is a feeling as a provider to see it and witness it firsthand. Yes, you want to provide some help, but the situation is unfortunately beyond imaginable. It is really reached levels that are uh, difficult to, ex to express or difficult to describe and simply needs to stop. What, what was happening is ca cannot be tolerated anymore. So that was one example. And another example I faced an anesthesiology technician who worked in the hospital, people who knew personally, and they were very uh, admiring him of his uh, uh, efforts and kindness, he now became the victim. So in his way to the hospital, he was uh, 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 attacked by a, a bombardment, and now he is the victim. So his uh, he had injuries in every single part of his body, in his head, his chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and legs. And multiple surgeons, uh, me as a cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, we have orthopedic surgeons, we have general surgeons, all were operating. And the anesthesiology colleagues were crying, watching their colleague uh, being trying to be salvaged. And what happened, we could not save the patient. The patient died on the table. That was, again, I don't want to spread sadness, but this is the reality. Like, yes, people want to, to help, want to, okay, let's provide medical aid, let's provide... Some, but if there's ongoing genocide, most likely the impact and the catastrophe cannot be stopped. So the best way to save lives is not to send the most experienced providers to send supplies, is to stop the genocide. That is the most life-saving act that needed to happen. And I know that the calls for ceasefire were from the beginning, and and we really admired the. I can I became recently a U.S. citizen, but I always was proud of of being part of the people here. How genuine they are, and in, in the demonstrations from the beginning, and how people were engaged in in saving humanity and and avoid uh, such uh, indiscriminate uh, collective punishment. They even if many people here are not necessarily political, but they they are united for the saving uh, lives is what really matters the most. And as a simple request of ceasefire, and everyone agreed on, and we had even, and as, you, as you might know, like City of Lansing, they did issue the, the uh, agreed on the resolution of ceasefire, many, Flint and Detroit and many areas uh, throughout the country that reflects the opinion of the people here that they want the ceasefire. And yet the government, Although sometimes claims that they want ceasefire, but they continue to send weapons. They continue to support such ge genocide in one way or another. So what I, I'll, I'll give opportunity to my colleagues to, to give, but the simple message is that everyone has to strongly emphasize the importance that the genocide has to stop. Supporting genocide is a crime and unfortunately, the U.S. became complicit with this. And, and unless everyone declares clearly that they are against it and wanted to stop, then people are viewing 
such individuals are also complicit because what's happening is not acceptable if there was some confusion at the beginning about what's happening, or is it uh, proportionate or not? Now, after seven months, there was no question at all that what's happening is targeting civilians. They are aiming to displace the entire population. They are aiming to make the place unlivable for the Palestinians. It is not targeting a, a, a specific group or trying to have a, a, a military targets. It's clear they want to create massacres to make it unlivable so that the Palestinians leave their homeland. And I think everyone has a responsibility to do what it takes from their end. Those who have some political impact, please exercise it. Those who have some uh, uh, public connections and media connections, please exercise it. And those who have financial uh, to support these medical missions, they always need uh, help or, the, uh, or food and, and AIDS. Uh, all these are needed, and we hope uh, a resolution uh, comes uh, comes soon. Thank you so much. Okay. So, Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is uh, Dr. Omar Kawash. Um, I want to thank you all for showing up, and uh, I want to thank you guys for your continued interest in this issue. Uh, obviously, as you know, this has been going on for a very long time, uh, over 100 years. This didn't start on October 7th. Uh, I want to applaud all of us and all of you for your continued efforts and for your support of this struggle. Um, a little bit of background for me. I was born in the United States. I was uh, raised back and forth overseas, but I've spent a majority of my life here in Lansing, Michigan. I was born here at Sparrow Hospital, graduated from Michigan State University. Most of my training is here. Uh, unlike my colleague, even though my um, background is Palestinian, because I'm American, I've had the opportunity to travel more freely. And I've been to the West Bank multiple times. Uh, my aunts and uncles live there. My parents live in Jordan and um, I travel there frequently. So as you can imagine, my entire life, I've been uh, uh, exposed to this um, conflict and painfully aware of it. You know, painfully aware of the subjugation of the Palestinian people and the colonization of that area and the facilitation of that by the United States government. So you can understand how I'm heavily conflicted and feel somewhat betrayed by the United States government and the Arab governments in general. And I feel like freedom of speech is somewhat of a joke, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, watching this recent chapter, the most recent chapter starting in October, 2023, um, it just gets more and more frustrating, right? It's, it's very difficult not to feel frustrated, right? The blatant hypocrisy you see of the politicians, um, the, um, the biased media, their intentional misleading reporting of this situation, you know, it's not neutral. You know, I, I felt frustrated many times, but I'll tell you what, this trip to Gaza, you know, I'm sure I helped many people, inshallah, but I think it helped me as well. You know, it, it demonstrated to me the meaning of patience and faith and resilience. And that made me realize the, the blessings that I had in front of me, the capabilities that I had in front of me, that the ability that I had in front of me, what I could do, what other people don't have, right? I'm American Palestinian, so I have a unique position. And that actually gives me a unique responsibility where we have the ability to voice our opinions, unlike the uh, people in the Arabic countries. Uh, we have the ability to affect influence, you know, and uh, influence our politicians. It might be for wrong motivations on their part, but we still have the ability to affect and change their decisions. We can redirect the narrative. We can redirect the narrative, and that's so important, what the, what the media is posting and how they portray us. And we can spread the word to groups that aren't familiar with this situation. You know, and as again, personally, because I'm American, I, I have more freedom to move. You know, there are a couple of doctors that wanted to go with us and they weren't able to go with us because they were denied. We had to get approval from COGAT, which is the Israeli uh, body here. They have to approve the physicians going overseas. If you have a Palestinian Hawiya or an identification, you uh, typically weren't allowed to go. Anyways, 
Um, my trip there was in March. Uh, it was more calm at that point than January and February, but you know, it was very eye-opening to me, even though I'm aware of what's going on in the news. You know, you drive through Egypt to get there, you drive through the Sinai, and you see thousands of aid trucks on the side of the road. Why can't they go in? No one can give you a straight answer. When you get there, of course, you see the decimation. You know, thousands of plastic tents, people running around in barefoot, bare feet. It looks apocalyptic, like the movies you watch. It's reality. We're, we're actually there right now. The world is split. Majority of the world is living in hunger and poverty and war decimated areas. And some of us sit privileged and don't even recognize it. You know, when we got to the hospital, there were thousands of refugees taking shelter in the hospitals. You couldn't even push a bed through the hallways. But they were making do with what they had. And again, that 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 made me feel somewhat um, embarrassed about how I felt before. You know, these people, after what they've gone through, they're so strong. They're so amazing. They're so thankful for what they have. They're still smiling. And they pray. They're thankful to God for what they have. How gracious they were. They were supplying us with food every day. And the, the meals they gave us were feasts. And they were starving. I had a bag of peanuts. And the person kept eyeing them. I felt embarrassed again, you know, repeatedly. Every day I felt embarrassed of what I had and what they don't. So as I said, this was a privilege to go, but it was also definitely a responsibility. As I feel that as a Palestinian, as an American, um, I have a huge responsibility to take part. But then again, all of us as human beings, we have a responsibility to all the other human beings on this earth. I don't want to take too long, but um, this, my message, um, I think that we need to leverage our voices, you know, as citizens of the United States. We need to leverage our voices. We need to endorse democracy. Stand up for what we say we believe in. You know, we need to endorse democracy and equality for all the regions, for all people, no matter what color you are, no matter what religion you are. Everybody calls this situation, this conflict, a complicated conflict. Whoever tells you it's a complicated conflict, they're trying to distort the story. They're trying to distort reality. It's not complicated. I'll tell you what's going to solve the problem. Equal rights for all humans. Muslims, Christians, Jews, brown, white, green, I don't care. Equal rights for all humans. That will solve all the problems. But no one wants to say that. So anyways, um, thank you all for coming again, and thank you for caring, and um, I'll end here. All right. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. So my background is a little bit different from my two colleagues here. My background is in public health on top of being a vascular surgeon. So I, I tend usually, and I try my best most of the time to stick to the numbers and to the fact because that's my background. That's how I see things. That's how I vision things. That's how I solve problems by thinking of numbers and whatnot. Unfortunately, I'm going to break from my habit today. I think I'm going to do the extreme. Um, I'm not going to mention numbers. I'm going to tell you two stories. That's it. That's my portion for the day. I'm going to tell you two stories that will summarize two things that I witnessed in Gaza. The misery they live in and the resilience they have. This is my message. This is what I want the people to know about Gaza right now. Misery and resilience. Because... I think that those two words summarizes almost everything. Yeah, I just unmuted it. So the two stories, and I apologize in advance. They are gruesome stories. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And I thought really hard about telling those stories. And maybe it will be disturbing to some of you. And I thought about it and said, you know what? If those stories are what the people of Gaza are actually living, the least we can do, the least, is at least to listen to them, even if they are disturbing. And again, I apologize in advance, but I have no other way to tell you what's going on other than those two stories. The first story, they called me, and I'm hearing a lot of echo, by the way. Oh. Yeah. I, I okay, no worries. We'll keep yeah. going. We'll pretend we're in Gaza. <laughs> All right. The first story, they called me for a kid. And I'm saying a kid because I don't know his age, I don't know his name, and you will know why in a minute. That kid was a victim of bombardment. 
they called me as a vascular surgeon to see what we can do to, to fix his limbs. When I walked in, here's what I saw. The right arm was completely amputated from the elbow. The left arm, he already lost finger three, uh, I'm sorry, four and five, and the third finger was semi-attached. So my job was to salvage what I can salvage. This is because this is what I do as a pastoral surgeon. I attach things to each other. So the, the, the right limb was completely gone. There was nothing to attach. It's gone, gone. On the left side, the third finger was hanging by a thread. So I spent about two hours attaching that third finger. And my hope was, I'm, 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 a, I'm a father myself. I know with how my kids eat. If I can give him three functional fingers, so at least he can feed himself since the other arm is completely gone. So I spent two hours working on that finger and I was so, I know for the lack of better word, proud of what I'm doing. As I'm finishing, I'm taking off my gown, I'm telling the staff, take me to his parent. And again, we don't know nothing about the kid. We think he's, based on what I know from my own kids, between nine months to 12 months, that's it. I asked the staff, take me to his parent. And they looked at me as if I'm an alien. They said, no one told you? I said, told me what? They said, all his family is wiped out. Parents, five or six siblings are completely gone. They were just wiped out. And we don't know of any surviving member of his family to take care of him. Now, I'm not new to this. I'm, I, I've done multiple missions before I've been I was actually in Turkey when in Gazi and Tab when, when the earthquake happened. So I'm I'm not new to all of this. I'm I'm fairly familiar. I, I, I think of myself as someone whose resilience, who's tough, who's not gonna break down easily. But I broke down in tears. I was like, who's gonna take care of this kid? He has no arm. And then I spent two hours just fixing the third finger, and the truth is most likely it's not gonna fail. It's gonna fail. We don't even know his name, we don't know his age, we know nothing about him. Now, here's where things become very personal. His diaper, he, he came with the diaper because, again, he's less than one year old. As you can imagine, there are no diapers in Gaza. And what most family do, they most family have two diapers. They have one on the baby, and then when it gets wet or smeared with stool and whatnot, they take it out, they wash it, they, they, they put it to, to dry while they do the other one. Well, guess what? This, cat, this kid came with one diaper only, the one he's using. So we spent the next few days alternating our own blanket as an alternative for the diver because he has only one diver. So we'll take it out, wash it ourselves with our bare hand, let it dry, and then use our blanket or, or, or something just to contain the urine and the stool until that one is dry. So that's the first story. And again, I don't know his name. I don't know his age. We think he's 11 to 12 months. That's all we know. So that's the first story. And what really bothers me, and the reason I'm mentioning this story, on that day, if you were to listen to the news, they would say, well, today, I know, 20, 30 Gaza people died, 25, 100 injured. But this is one story. This is the story of this kid. And you can imagine the misery that this kid is living and how he's going to live all his life, where he lost all his family, he lost an arm, and he has barely two and a half fingers in the other hand. This is one story. The second story, and we'll finish with that. I was once in the operating room when they called me and they said, you need to leave everything and come to the ER. We have a situation. And they said, hey, come on, guys. I'm, I have someone dying in front of me. What's the situation? They said, we cannot explain it to you. Just drop everything and come to the ER. In the ER, a lady came. When the bombardment happened, she had her baby in her hand, in her right hand. When the bombardment came, everything was so, the heat was so strong that not only it killed her baby, her baby was melted, fused in her hand. So now this mother, who was still awake, by the way, who was still awake and talking, she was looking at her baby, and I'll tell you her name in a minute, because it's relevant. She was looking at her dead baby, motionless baby, melted in her arm, fused with her hand. Now, obviously her hand is dead. There is nothing you can do about it. The baby is dead and it's fused with the hand. And they called me and said, we have a dead baby, we need to bury it. 
We cannot detach it from the arm. We need you to do something. And up till this moment, I'm looking and I can imagine what they are going to ask me to do. But I was sincerely hoping I'm wrong and they would not ask me to do that. And they were hoping the opposite. They were hoping that I get it and I know what I need to do. But between my stubbornness and my, my hope that I was wrong, they gave up and they told me, they were like, Baba, we need you to amputate the arm with the baby on it so we can bury the baby. So I did. I took her to the OR. I amputated the arm with the baby on it. And I didn't even try to detach the baby from the arm because it was really beyond any, any effort to do that. And they went, and initially I was hoping to go to bury it myself or to be part of that, but I couldn't. I was in, in such an emotional breakdown that I couldn't do that. So I just did the surgery, I did the amputation, and they went trying to sleep, take some break. I spent the whole night crying. And then the next day, I want to go and meet that mother again. Because when I met her, you can imagine the situation. I wasn't in my best shape to, to say what I should say. I didn't have the basic manners to say, please accept my condolences. I didn't do any of that. So I said the next day, I should do the basic manners and be a human and just go and at least offer my condolences. So I walked in the room. And as I'm going in, clearly you can see the mother. I recognize her immediately. Clearly you can see she didn't sleep the night either, just like me. And you can see her eyes are red, beefy red from crying and whatnot. As I walked in, she looked at me and said with her other arm, are you the surgeon who cut my hand yesterday? And I couldn't answer. And then she kept getting louder and louder to the point where she was almost yelling at me. She was like, are you the surgeon who cut my arm yesterday? And eventually I said, yes, I am. Somehow, and I was expecting an emotional breakdown. At that moment, she smiled. This is the first time I see the mother smiling. She smiled and said, well, thank you. She said, I'm very shukran to you. And I was in absolute shock. How is she smiling? How is she saying thank you? And I, I kept quiet. I, I didn't know what to say. And she said, well, I bet you don't know why I'm thanking you and you don't know the whole story. I was like, of course I don't know the whole story. Tell me the whole story. I said, well, you don't know that. What happened yesterday was a real blessing. And she said, that daughter that you buried yesterday, that you took off my arm yesterday, she's special to me. And she was special from the minute she was born. Her name is Minnatullah. Minnatullah in Arabic means the gift of God. And she said, this, this Minnatullah, she was special from the day she was born. Everything about her was special. The way she smiled, the way she laughs, the way she runs around. She was special in everything. And now I'm so happy that even when the way she died, she was special. Because look, think about it this way. She died as a martyr. And she's such a lovely gift of God, hence the name Minnatullah, that even when she died, she took peace of me with her. That at the day of judgment, when God resurrect all of us, she's going to come out of the grave with my arm in, in it. And she will take my arm with her to heaven. So I'm really, really happy and blessed with that. And that's why I'm saying thank you. And that's why I'm saying th this, is, this is a blessing. So those two stories, and they have way more, but for the sake of time, I think those stories summarizes what Omar mentioned about the resilience and the misery. Because, and again, I'm not new to this. I've, I've seen so many bad situations. I've been in, in Northwest Syria during the civil war or during the conflict. I was in Gazi and Tab, Turkey, when the earthquake happened on the morning of the earthquake. I was there, my hotel collapsed. I survived the earthquake by a few seconds. But I've seen a lot of misery before, and I thought I've seen it all, and I've seen it, I, 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 it could never get any worse, but I was so wrong. I was so, so wrong. But yet, and that's what's special about Gaza. That's why, just like Omar mentioned, I feel honored that I went there, because I've never imagined that I would see resilience and misery in one place, and I've seen it there. And I'm very, very humbled with what they see. I, I honestly don't know other way to describe it, but 
I, I echo what my colleagues say. I'm not going to repeat it about being active and whatnot. So thank you so much for listening and um, we'll take questions. We'll take a question, but I'll bring the mic to you if anyone has a question. Or are there, oh, okay, yeah. I don't know if any of you feel qualified to comment on this, but one of the things we see in the news is this aid platform that the United States is going to build with the boats delivering aid to Gaza. Is that is that any hope of accomplishing anything, or is that just a show? Honestly, I, I answer that because I think I forgot to mention that I think I mentioned there are thousands and thousands of aid truck waiting on the Egyptian side, literally thousands. So I, I even made the calculation as I'm driving from Egypt to Gaza, we start seeing the trucks 40 kilometers away from the border. So literally for 40 kilometers, which is about 28 miles, 25, 25 miles, for 25 miles, there are literally trucks for 25 months. So there are so many aids waiting to enter. So for me, honestly, that port, I see it as a joke. I don't know any other way to describe it. Literally, you have thousands and thousands of trucks waiting to enter. I can't see what's the point of creating the port other than just PR stunt or something like this. That's my view, but feel free to disagree. I agree. So we have to remember that uh, Gaza was under blockade for more than 17 years. And it was uh, placed in a position that they could not survive except for having AIDS in terms of thousands of, of trucks on a daily basis. Just to have. You said Gaza was in what for 17 years? Under blockade, siege for yeah, 17 years. So. And they were, because now they say, okay, now there's a military occupation. It was. As defined by the international law, it was under occupation. It has never been not under occupation. Even in the last 17 years, when they claimed that the military uh, groups went outside, like the, uh, the soldiers went outside Gaza, they were still controlling the electricity, the food, entry and exit from it all the time. So it was a true definition of occupation. Anyhow, so they were so much dependent from the food to come from outside in terms of thousands of trucks, you can imagine 2.2 million needing thousands of A like at the normal basis, not in catastrophic situations. So now when have this uh, war or this uh, recent conflict, there has been a complete closure of any access or any ports for long times. And even when they are at certain moments, they allow even if hundreds or even a thousand, that does not even meet the daily standard requirement to keep them alive, not even to compensate the huge losses that is there. That's one aspect to, to look at it. But also, what is really people there were hoping for, not for the US to send more food. This is not what they were wanting. They were hoping that US to stop Israel from their aggression. That's the only ask that they have. And this is what we are hoping that they would do. Yes. Yeah, just ask them. You know, I'm, I'm sorry for sounding negative, but um, during this bombardment, um, the, the husbands were begging for heavy equipment, bulldozers, so they can, they can dig their dead ones and their suffering out of the rubble. But they were denied that. But then when they decided to build this port, all of a sudden, all the heavy equipment came in in a matter of, what, hours? And so they took all the rubble with the dead bodies in it, and they built this port. This port has the corpses of the husbands in it. I, I, you know, I've seen the hypocrisy for way too long. And so, again, I'm sorry for sounding negative, but it, I can't help but think of the alternate motives. This is now uh, a, a military base in Gaza. I don't believe it's there for the purpose of bringing in aid. You can't you can't bomb people and then tell them we're going to bring in aid. You know, we're not uh this is it's a slap in the face to make me to you know to tell me that 
I'm not that ignorant. I'm not the smartest person, but I am a neurosurgeon. That gives me some credibility, you know. It's a joke. The United States has the leverage and the ability to stop this immediately. Thank you. My understanding is that the infrastructure in Gaza is pretty much completely gone. Electricity, water, Wi-Fi, gas, um, just gone. If or when this genocide stops, is it even going to be possible for people to live in Gaza again with all of those, all of those things gone? So let me answer this. Thank you for your question. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the goals of this aggression is to make Gaza unlivable for the Palestinians. It was not uh, a goal-directed mission to, uh, to uh, like only attack certain group or certain areas. They want the place to be unlivable. So that's from their perception that this is what they're doing. But it seems they did not learn the lesson that the Palestinians will not leave their land. They are resilient, this is their land, and they will not leave. Despite all this aggression, they, the Palestinians, as I said, my, my, my family were under the occupation, under the massacres, and many of them left with the keys of their home, homes believing that they would come very shortly afterward and they would never have the right to go back. Now people realize that they should never, it's better to die inside your land and never leave it alone. So back to your question, is it livable? They are trying to make it unlivable, but the Palestinians will continue to live there and the occupier should respect their right to stay there and occupiers will not stay there. Everyone is welcome to stay as a citizen, as, as a humans, as respectful individuals in the community, but not as an aggressor or occupier anymore. So the basic necessities are lacking, obviously. So yes, the food, the huge shortage, and the, and the water, and the electricity. Yet, I don't want to to be completely in mind that there's no internet. There is, and it's a hit and miss. For example, it's multiple times that even the hospital, it goes out of uh, electricity, and then there are some uh, generators that uh, to provide it. The, the internet is very weak, so it's a hit and miss. But yes, there is some access, but not enough to maintain a quality of life by any means, by any standard. The American standards, it's nothing, basically. But we think they deserve life. They, they are respectable people. And they, like as all humans, they deserve dignity and they deserve their uh, rights to be respected. But the very least, they deserve their homeland to be protected. And just to add to that, and I'm sure you've seen it, Hamal, I'm sure you've seen it. Every time there's a collapse building, and I don't know if you've seen it in the news, there's a tent on top of it. And if you pay close attention, the owner of that building, when the building completely collapsed with the bombardment, they whoever survived came and created a tent on top of the collapsed building. And there's nothing safe about living in that tent because as you can imagine, all the bars are going in. And I've seen it everywhere. Anytime there's a collapsed building, there's a tent of it, the owner of that building. And one day I was going from one hospital to the other, and I was like, I, I can't, st I, I cannot, I need to ask them that question, even though it might be a silly question, but I need to ask them. So I stopped out of the ambulance and they went to the owner of that tent. And they asked him, I was like, listen, you have five kids running around within that tent. There are so many bars. This is extremely unsafe for you to live in this tent in this settings. Why don't you go somewhere and spread a tent somewhere slightly safer, slightly safer, just to avoid all those rods and rocks and whatnot. And I asked him that question and he looked at me and he couldn't have a word to describe to me. And then he turned to his, his son and said, 
But look at this guy. He doesn't understand the concept of owning a land. And he didn't answer me. He just walked away. Because for him, it was such a stupid question that I asked him, how do you live here? For him, he couldn't even have the word to explain that I am the owner of this land. Why would I leave? It is unlivable, but guess what? I'm going to live here. So he literally, he couldn't have word to describe to me. He literally looked at his son, like, look at this idiot. He didn't call me an idiot in his face, in my face, but I'm sure when I went, he did. But I mean, he couldn't fathom that someone doesn't understand the concept that this is your land, you don't leave it. So I thought that was wrong. I'm sure you've seen it there again. Thank you. Back to the full court issue, which looked like a delaying tactic since uh, I understand a aid group built a uh, port, uh, a recept, uh, receiving area in the sea, a jetty, whatever they call it, to receive, to do aid in just a matter of days. So first of all, it looked like a stunt. And secondly, my understanding, and I, I'm glad you mentioned the military base, but my understanding is there are huge natural gas reserves off the coast there, yeah. and that the US, France, and I think Israel have already signed a, a pact to exploit those natural gas reserves. So removing the Gazans remove access for, to that wealth. And then I guess the third point is that there were plans to develop a wider, deeper canal to compete with the Suez Canal. So the U.S. Um, developing such a port would be to uh, profit, mm -hmm. not to develop people's lives. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with everything you said. That's... No, honestly, yeah. I agree. I agree. No, I, I, honestly, there's nothing to add. Well, well said. <laughs> you spoke my mind. Thank you. You should come with me to Gaza next time. <laughs> uh, I was wondering: is have there been a delegation of doctors that have gone to various uh, representatives or political leaders to talk to them to kind of, you know? Tell your stories and put forward your case about what's happening there. So thank you for this important question. So yes, uh, since the event started in October, we have been in touch with multiple politicians, including uh, uh, senators and uh, uh, representatives uh, locally and uh, uh, nationally. Um, so basically, what we know that they already know. So there's no much lack of information like that they wish that they had, then a different action will take place, which is very disappointing to be honest. Like, see these like overwhelming stories that you heard, they even know more than that. But unfortunately, again, I don't want to label everyone like that. There are other considerations that are taking place, which is overall is a shame because they are not putting the priorities of the United States or the citizens of the United States as their first priority, which by default, what I learned being a US citizen here, the vast majority of people care about the human rights. They care about others. They genuinely, I actually, I want to tell you, people, the Arabs, for example, they are proud of the Americans when they go to the streets and they sometimes take some motivation and courage, like when they, like after months, they slow down, then when they see people genuinely in the streets and protest against their government, they feel embarrassed. Like, like come on, these people who are thousands of miles away from even a different religion, different background, and they are still persistent, they, then they, we should do at least the same, if not more. So there's a huge disconnect between the U.S. people and the U.S. government. And it seems once you get into the government, you get polluted in a way that, and you know, there are lots of lobbies and interests that are impacting their decisions. So back to your question, they do not lack information, but they have ingenuine interests 
to a degree that the only way if the votes are strong enough that don't put them back to their seats, then they will realize it is not the few thousands or millions that put them to see it is the public election so even if there are some influential lobbies but if the american people say no to such a thing and they remember these individuals allowed the u.s like weapons to go and they did not stop against that then they will come and do what you are asking them to do not with the other interests But we're going to hear. Yes. So, um, you know, before I went in March, uh, uh, Alyssa Slot Slotkin and Debbie Stabenow came to our community and we appreciate that. And we spoke to them. And, uh, you know, that was one of the motivating reasons why I went. In all honesty, I was uh, extremely saddened when they left. Uh, it's not a matter of ignorance. Everybody knows, you know, everybody knows. And if someone doesn't know by now, I don't think they want to know. And there's obviously reasons behind that. You know, these uh, politicians, they're just propagating the false narrative that's put forth by the Israelis. And, and they're not, they're, their stories are not put to the standards at all. No one's vetted. And so, you know, they say these stories. And when Slotkin came here, the story of the 40 beheaded babies had been debunked a long time ago. And still she was saying that, 40 beheaded babies. You know, and the story of rape has been debunked repeatedly, yet people still say the politicians repeat these things. And so they, they just they push forth these stories so they can dehumanize the Palestinians. So it makes killing them much easier. You know, we, we've we've heard it before. We've seen it before. This is not something new. It's not a matter of ignorance. This is this is um, intentional. So yes, we have tried. And the reason why I decided to go in the first place was because I felt that, again, um, I was betrayed. I was betrayed by the my government here and also betrayed in many ways by the Arab governments as well. And so I had to do something with my own hands. So thank you. Online question? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay, our online question is How can we in America help the Palestinian cause which can make a meaningful difference? So, yeah, it's an important question. Uh, we, we hope that we answered part of it uh, already. Each individual should think deeply what they can do to save a humanity. There's a, a verse in, in uh, Quran, whoever saves one life as if saving the entire humanity. So each one should be able to do something. There's no excuse for anybody to say that I can't do anything. There is something that every individual can do. And the bare minimum is to condemn internal this is not right this is in islam if you don't have that little thing you are not a believer you are not a good person anymore so that's the the bare minimum is to to say this is the the for the falsehood or the inappropriate act to be condemned internal this is i'm against it but if you have the power to change it at least verbally you have to do it if you have the power to change it with your hand then to do it so to answer the question you know more than others what you as an individual can do. There are people who can make dramatic differences and yet they are not doing it. And there are others, their means are obviously more humble and more limited. But if everyone took it seriously that they will exhaust all possibilities that they have to make a difference, then definitely the difference will take place. On that note, I'd like to highlight what's happening in universities right now. And again, think about what's what happened back in Vietnam. And I was reading about the history of encampment in the US. This is not new. It happened even with the civil rights movement. And then it happened with Vietnam War. And then it happened with the South Africa apartheid. 
So, and in each of those examples, those university partners made a huge impact on the American government decision to, to help or not help or withdraw support. So I cannot emphasize enough the little things that you can do. So even as little as supporting a student. So every weekend since the beginning of the encampment, me, my wife, and three kids, we go to the encampment site with U of M. We just go support them. We take some tea, some cookies, and whatnot, and we go, we hug them, we high-five them. We just give them energy. And maybe each one of you should do that. That's number one. Number two, and in terms of practical advice, if I can ask each one of you to make it your mission every day to talk to five people about Gaza, just make it your mission. That's your homework. Every day, don't go to sleep until you talk to five people about Gaza. Just talk to them, whether they are agree with you or totally against you. Fine, just get the conversation going. Because as Hisham and Omar mentioned, clearly the government, our government, unfortunately, do not care about what's going on. And they know the fact they're not going to change it. The only way they will change is with public pressure. And that's why we are here. That's why I gave up on talking to senators and anyone, because I literally, I couldn't care less about talking to them anymore, because I know they know. So that's why I'm here talking to you now, because if each one of you could talk to five people every day, we can make a difference. The public pressure will change the American government attitude. So that's my, my humble request. So I'm, I'm going to try, try and keep it simple. Uh, just keep your eyes and your ears open. And again, apply that simple rule. Um, equal rights for all human beings, no matter what religion, no matter what color. If you apply that to everything you hear, it will be pretty simple. You know, do Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? Okay. Do Palestinians have a right to self-determination? You know, I, I want you to think about, you know, 70% of the weapons in Israel that they're using come from the United States. A majority of those soldiers have American passports. What does that tell you? You know, when you hear a story, I want you to reverse the words. Switch Israeli for Palestinian and see how it sounds. If an Israeli settler left their settlement in the West Bank, which is supposed to be Palestinian territory, left their settlement, they killed the Palestinian, a native there, a Palestinian. Is it right for the Palestinian to go and destroy their entire settlement? Would anybody support that? No, but flip the story. It's okay for Gaza. And if they've killed 40,000 people and 70% of them are women and children, and they're saying they killed how many combatants? It makes absolutely no sense. They're using AI to generate targets and they wait till the targets go home. And as long as they kill one person, one male, they consider it a combatant. If anybody was involved with the Hazan government, they consider it Hamas. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's frustrating. And um, again, it's, um, sometimes you feel it's beyond repair, but we have to stay positive and push forward and, do everything we can every day. Again, say keep simple, equal rights for all human beings. Thank you. I don't want to sit down. Yes, I have a comment. I mean, uh, we are, uh, as American citizens, the part time, see it clear, the double standard. When people started in Gaza, the doctor said on the subway, Israel just received $8 billion. And, uh, and this is going to go on for a while. And another comment they have about this, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, narrative about this, four aviated children, members of the media, have been asking the Israeli government the names of those children up to yesterday. Has really government did not provide one name for those victims in Israel and so on. So it's time for us as American citizens and taxpayers to start asking questions. Eight billion dollars to Israel, just down the street, people are being starving for years and years and years. Thank you very much.
So I want to say something in, in that regard. We have repeatedly heard that the bonds with Israel are unbreakable and they will always have unconditional support. This policy is hurting the interests of the United States. This, under which circumstance that you as US citizens should accept a foreign country will have unbreakable relations regardless of what they do, and they will have unconditional support regardless of the harm that they are doing to your own citizens. One example of the harm, the reputation of the United States is damaged. So they are viewing the hypocrisy, they are viewing how all when they claim that they care about the human rights or respecting the international laws, and when the International Court of Justice say there's a plausible genocide, oh no, we don't care about that. Or when there's like the, uh, the Security Council tried to multiple times to do the ceasefire, repeatedly they were vetoing it, and the last time they just did not veto it, but next day saying, but it is not compulsory to, to abide by that. What kind of message are they doing? They are trying to protect an aggressor on the expense of your own citizens. So you are being harmed by such a thing. We're not saying that they have to be against a certain country, but if, if your own brother is doing harm to humanity, you should be the first one to stop that person. So this narrative that the bonds are unbreakable or the unconditional support has to stop. So that's one thing. The other part with the, with the Israeli government is doing now, they are trying to label anyone who's against the police of Israel as anti-Semitic. And this story is like, we can't even hear it anymore because it is laughable. Like this is mixing the religion with the politics is a dirty game that they have been using for many decades right now. No one should support anti-Semitism, even the Palestinians there, because Jews were living in peril with the, with the Muslims and Christians for centuries. This lie saying that if you are against the state of Israel, you are anti-Semitic. And they are, who are they accusing? Your own people, your, your kids, the, the students in the university campuses, they are labeling anti-Semite. They are want. They are forcing our government. They are in, inducing them to have the police to arrest them under the what is the the the, the accusation? They are anti-Semite. This is an abuse of the Americans. So I think Americans have to stand up for their own rights because it is not only caring about others, which is important, and Americans in general care about others, but it is impacting your own life. And allowing such a foreign country that is not neutral, it's an aggressor that is being hated and right now by everyone by just watching the aggression they're doing, staying, supporting such criminal country will only lead to more devastation to this own country. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your for what you do. Um, I just want to um, comment briefly on uh, Alyssa Slavkin uh, and my own experience. I'm, I'm from Gaza. I have lost uh, uh, 29 uh, as of two days ago of the people from my family that we know of. Um, Alyssa Slavkin in the last bombing of Gaza, I sent her a pleading email or a phone call telling her that my family is being bombed. Please intervene and ask for a ceasefire. And what does she do? She sends an email back saying how much she is a Zionist, how much she, when she, in her youth, she went to Israel, how proud of the time she spent in Israel. And this Slavkin is a rotten human being. Now, but, it, and just to, to speak to what the doctor have, uh, doctors have said, I, I, would, I would still uh, uh, um, send uh, emails and phone your elected representatives. It's not about informing them of what is happening. They know, they know it very well, but to bear witness, this is what we all should do. 
to tell them, each and every one of them, that we see you, that we see you. Every time they sign for billions of dollars to kill people in Gaza, we should say to them, we see you. And I think I need a... That's an intervention. That's something we can do. Thank you. I'm, I'm available. I'm, I'm here for the whole night. Oh. Let's go. <laughs> The lady. So I just have to say, the first day when Netanyahu bombed, I texted a bunch of friends and I said, Gaza will not be standing at the end of this for whenever this ends. I mean, he's just that evil. So that's number one. Secondly, on scripts one morning, there was a thing that ran across and it said that Blinken said that that the Israeli military had done some egregious act, and that's what prompted Hamas to do the, and the bombing. It's the only thing I ever saw on it. I don't know if there's any follow-up or anything, because that was my very initial thought, is what prompted this action right now? You know, what prompted this, that, that normally when your back's to the wall, that's what prompts something like this to happen. So that's second. Um, so um, one of the things you said about doing something is Scripps News, and they had an awesome show on, um, I don't know, on um, what's happening in Gaza. And, and they actually show you know, the military guys getting together with their, with their sunglasses, Israeli military getting together with their sunglasses and their rifles and celebrating. So, but um, what I wanted to say was, oops, sorry, but, um, but I called Script News. I called Script News a number of times about this. I didn't know, and I compare this to what's going on in the Ukraine as well, that we seem to be, the US seems to be unbalanced as far as their, that Israel is not a member of NATO. I thought that they were, they are not. So there's, it, it, so there's just not. But anyway, what I wanted to say was um, Script, Script News does have a phone number and I've been calling that and just saying, you know, I asked about the Blinken thing, um, that kind of thing. So there is a number for to call Script News and and that, and I would be glad to share it with you. You know, share it. Them. Can you share it? I can. It's um, 833-472-5555. And you'll get a recording, but the, I've been doing that because this has just been. Thank you for doing that. Destroying. Well, I don't. I mean, it's just, no, seriously, thank you. It, I, but, it, but it's devastating. And like seriously, said, don't, don't underestimate anything you are doing. No, Even one I, phone call can make a difference. So thank you. I'm 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 genuine no, about I this. I understand that. I just I do. I feel helpless. And I no, just, you are not. So, but the last thing I want to say is when you look back at World War II, and I, it's, it wasn't. <coughs> For appeasement, when when was it Chamber? I don't think it was Chamberlain, but who appeased Hitler by by um, giving them Poland? Believe it. <laughs> and you just look back at that and just think, oh my God, how could they do that? And I think that this is present day. What's going on there? So I just wanted to say that my heart bleeds for all of you. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. I do have a question. Hi. Um, I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I read the articles about you. Um, after, I don't know how you pronounce your name. I came in late. Um, uh, but uh, I appreciated the part of the articles where you talked about your coworkers bringing medicines and supplies and good wishes. Um, and I think it's especially important now that um, Sparrow is owned by the University of Michigan, which is being currently fought on the campus front. And I was wondering, um, especially thinking about engagement with unions like MNA, um, the UAW, or um, <laughs> is it, do you feel like it's possible to uh, fight the institutions that we work for um, 
and are that have like complicity or ties to the ongoing genocide. Um, and what type types of resources or spaces would be useful in aiding that in our communities? So, so absolutely, yes. And again, I echo what Omar and Hisham said. We all, almost every one of us, gave up on the politician. Clearly, they are not changing their mind simply because there is some ulterior motive that promote their support to Israel. Fine, keep it. I think the only way to do something right now is through public pressure. And I, I fully heartily agree with you that that's the only way, and it's happening. And again, read history. Read what happens in Vietnam War when the encampment happened. And unfortunately, and it, it helps me to say this, the only change that started to happen during Vietnam War is some of those students, unfortunately, were killed. So unfortunately, we don't learn the easy way. We always have to learn the hard way. And I feel that this is coming our way, unfortunately, soon. Some major injury is going to happen, and some public outcry will follow that. And only then, the American government will change position. But I, I fully agree that now the battle is on the street for us here in the US. It's not with the senators, it's not with the government, it's not with the White House. It is on the street with the students, with you guys here. I think that's where the real battle is. Yeah, I would fully agree and I appreciate uh, your uh, uh, great comments uh, and observations. And yes, I support that we pursue any channel that can enhance the impact of what we're doing. So we, it's not necessarily we give up on the politicians, we'll continue our pressure on them, but there are the other uh, community-based institutions and the academic institutions like University of Michigan and, and the places that we work at, like Sparrow, which is part of the we are right now. So yes, I know that there is in general uh, uh, a note of like stay away from politics, but this is a human rights issue. So it is not political issue. And I think to continue pressurizing our own administrators, like the president of the hospital or the, the, the leaders of the units and stuff. Because back to your comment, there was no individual that I spoke with among my coworkers. All of them showed their support. Like they actually, some of them, they wish that they could come with me. And those who did not see me, when I came back, they said, Promise me, if you were to go again, I want to come with you. To be honest, actually, I don't remember his name. I don't. I, he he barely knew me. I barely knew him. He just stopped me, saying, "I want to come with you next time." So, and uh, as I said, some of them said, "How can we donate? How can we make supplies?" These people really care, and they are genuine. And I think to make it more of an organized act, it becomes more influential. The students are doing great job in that regard. And that's pressurizing their organization. If individuals state it as individual without organizing such uh, a collective uh, uh, move, they would have not cared much. So I think within that, again, we're not sort of protesting against the institution, but I think making it more organized work to send emails, to make a representation that we as workers or co-workers or as a unit, we stand in solidarity with the rights of Palestinians or any, any people defending their land. And we want to, for such organization, I'll now you is a bigger institution that, that may have ties abroad and stuff to us. It's like, we want to even investigate or to just to verbalize that we, if there were some connections, we want to stand against that. Yes, I endorse that and I encourage that. And I think uh, very admirable to do so. As I walk back, I just want to say that in 1978, Michigan State University was the first to divest from South Africa, so it is possible. <laughs> Hi. Um, so as, as most of y'all probably know, in February, or maybe January, when there was the ICJ ruling, um, and it explicitly called out the actions um, as a genocide, which is the term that's, I, I would say, probably never been levied against Israel for their actions towards Palestinians, despite what they've been doing for the last seven decades. And yet, um, 
nothing was really done and they weren't really held to account. Um, and as someone who, you know, I, I grew up in the United States, I was born in Canada, I've been surrounded by the West my entire life, and I've been taught to hold faith in these institutions at like a global scale. And when they hold all the power, and yet the US is allowed to veto it at any stage, when the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, calls this a genocide, it has the makings of a genocide, we're not plausible. able to plausible. even stop the gunfire at that point. Um, it makes me wonder um, how much trust can we really even have in our institutions at large? Doesn't this call for a change of American society that will have a ripple effect on the entire world? Like, at the, when do we finally say that our institutions can change as well? Yes, that's my question. Okay, so uh, mine is a bit more of a simple question before that. The people that made the South African divestment possible, I miss you, are already over there. So can you please get a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're working on the divestments as well, and they've been a big help. So hopefully, that's in the process. But my question is very simple. I'm not going to ask you a very complex question. So you guys said you guys are working on the people over there in the medical field, and you've guys seen it all. So my question is just really simply: just what is the morale of the people in Gaza? Like, are, are do they have hope? I know they hold on to the faith of the Islam very strongly. How is their morale over there? Do they have hope? Are they losing hope? Are they? You know, that's just my. That's my question. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank you very much for the what you have done um, uh, by providing the aid to Palestinians. Uh, as an international student, I'm not allowed actually to uh, express my opinion actually about this uh, issue. I have experience um, on LinkedIn uh, when uh, some Israeli posted something about pictures. And uh, I said, I hope uh, the other side also you know, to provide me some help. And then I saw a couple of people actually criticizing me, saying you are anticipated. So I stopped. So um, as a way to help, actually, um, as an intention to this from Libya, the uh, secretary of the president of the Libyan government is a friend of mine. So if you have a special request, um, aid or something, I can connect, I can inform them if there's any way they can help. Hopefully, they can help. Thank you very much. So, thank you so much for that question. So, one question about the, the hope and or the moral. So collectively, the people of Palestine will never lose hope. And that's what's uh, encouraging us that uh, they will never surrender. It is their right to stay in their homeland and they will fight to the end. And it is an integral belief within them that they will have their rights back. So that's one aspect, however, at individual levels, it is sometimes comforting for us saying, oh, they are very special. They will deal with it. They can deal with it. Regardless of how miserable the situation, they can somehow, they have a special way of handling it. I think this is unfair way of thinking because at the end they are humans and they are under miserable conditions. So it is the same individual that we're seeing and collectively they will never lose hope, but they were devastated. You can see how broken from inside and to comfort ourselves that, I'm talking especially about those who are from Palestinian descent or those have even closer ties. I think I was blaming myself thinking that, okay, they can handle it. And I think they, we are as responsible as they are. So if we, if we can't handle being on a daily basis, being active as to support them, it is shame on us to expect that they will be on a daily basis fighting and not giving up. Because again, this is a human nature, they are not angels. So the reason I'm saying this 
is that we should not spare any effort to support them. Because at the end, if they fail, that's our failure. We abandon them. They are still believing that the hope will not be lost, but we should be part of that mission to be accomplished. We should not let their hope go away. Dr. Kawash, any last minute thoughts? Sure. Uh, don't vote for Biden. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's worried about what's going to happen if you don't vote for Biden. It's going to be much worse, but I'll tell you what, you cannot predict what happens in this world. You need to do what's in front of you. You need to make the right choice in front of you, regardless as to what you think the results are going to be. Because I'll tell you, you don't know what the results are going to be. If everybody did what's right in front of them, the simple things that are right in front of them, the difficult things, then I think that we'd be in a better place right now. So don't vote for Biden. Don't worry about the outcome. It's not on your head. We can have a different setting of discussion for this all together. Yeah, we, we can come back to this discussion. Okay. It's almost time to end, and okay. I wanted to invite. Sorry. Yeah, can you come up and talk about the peace education? Yes. In my final comment, I don't know if it was made uh, as I walk up here, is that uh, Americans are being damaged by the repression of students the surveillance and the uh, crackdown on free speech and supporting our students is incredibly important. Uh, they're on the front lines. So I have some good news for you. We have the Peace Education Center, your hosts, one of your hosts for tonight, has an uh, event that you surely will not want to miss, where you will be entertained, informed, and be able to contribute both to the, excuse me, Peace Education Center and to the Palestinian American Medical Association. So this is Mother's Day for Peace. And as a mother, I am certainly going to be there. And we all have mothers uh, and, or have had. So this is May 10th, write it down, 7 to 9, Allen Marketplace in Lansing, that's on Kalamazoo Street lovely venue, and we're going to have music, fun, and a powerful message of peace. We're thrilled to announce special guest Julia Ward Howe, along with live music by Lansing's very own indie folk darlings, the dangling participle. Oh, wow. I'm a dangling participle often. There's a suggested donation of $25.00. So all that money goes to the Peace Education Center and the Palestinian American Medical Association. So you want to be there. You want to pay admission. You probably want to throw a little bit more money into the pot so we can make a difference there. And uh, it'll be an unforgettable night. So please let me know if you missed any of the details. I'll be here. The second quick announcement is there is such a thing as the Coalition for a Free Palestine, which has a number of student groups, including the Hurry Up uh, group that, that worked on the encampment recently. Uh, community groups, our very own Peace and Justice team from Edgewood, the Peace Center, lots of organizations uh, that get together to coordinate their work and plan ongoing resistance to the genocide. That's Wednesday night, 8 p.m. via Zoom. And I really suggest that in your, if you're in an organization or an individual who wants to coordinate our fight back in this community, see me afterwards. Thank you. Uh, so uh, that's, I just want to say thank you again to these three amazing people, uh, and you're so inspiring and um, given us a lot to think about tonight, and I think that's a really good idea if everyone can talk to five people, 
right, every day, and then have those five people talk to five people, and have those five people talk to five people, then we can bring awareness to what's going on in Gaza and hopefully have a ceasefire soon, <laughs> and in the long term, a free Palestine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.